you know, um, it gives me immense pleasure today to, to be talking to John Hicks, um, a writer, and also I th in our brief conversation already, I've described him as a fellow Blake head. Um, and, and as much as anything, this is really an opportunity, obviously, to talk about your new book, William Blake versus the World, um, but also then to, to explore kind of your your how Blake has been an inspiration for you personally, actually, in many ways. Yeah. I mean, you know, William Blake now, Why Matters More Than Ever. I mean, that, that was a great book as well. And, <laughs> and it was very, it was very interesting to, to read that, read this new book with that in the background, actually. So that there were various bits and pieces that were coming through that I wanted to, to explore a little bit today. Um, but yeah, also then, as you mentioned, uh, you know, your, your, your background writing about the KLF and various other forms of British culture and history yeah. are also incredibly fascinating to me as well. So, you know, where, wherever the conversation will take us today will be absolutely Wherever fine. you want to start, Jason, we've got, yeah, we got yeah. options. I, I'm, I'm going to start with a really simple one. And forgive me, you know, both of us have been spending so much time thinking and writing about Blake. It, yeah. seems, it seems almost paltry to start with a question like this, but, but I get asked this a lot. So... Why Blake for you? And I don't mean generally, you, you say a lot mm. in the book, and we'll come to it, you know, Blake for the, us now in the world, but why Blake for you, John Higgs? Um, I want to say clarity. I know that seems the most strange answer to describe Blake, but yeah. the further I got into Blake and the more I read Blake and the more I built a model in my mind of what he was trying to tell me, the clearer the world became. I just found yeah. it, it's his system, his mythological system, just useful. It's just incredibly, incredibly useful. And I just live for the day when they're shared, you know, cultural touchstones. And we can sort of say, well, that's yours I'm speaking, or, or something like that. <laughs> Everyone will know what we mean. And that's, Absolutely. That's what I want. It's interesting. It's because I spend so much of my time, you know, <laughs> for, for, for <laughs> yeah, I need to get out more, but I spend so much time around people who are interested in Blake. You, that, you know, that's yours and speaking there. There is yeah. this incredible shorthand you get from Blake. And when you kind of, you're in a room, somebody, and kind of, you get this, don't you? you? You know what I'm talking about. And you can compress a whole host of ideas yeah. into mm. an image or a single phrase or elements like that. Definitely. But at the same time, this is what's off put into a lot of people. Yeah. I, fi I find, which is what the book is for, really, yes. well, the whole point of yes. the book is um, people are drawn to Blake and they feel connected to Blake. But for some reason, they feel it's like almost forbidden to sort of take it any further. They, they don't have permission or, or it's, it's odd. And I've been really struck by it since in the weeks or so that the books come out because, yes. I'm, you know, hoping for those sort of people it would work. But the reaction's been beyond what I was sort of expecting. And it does, it does feel like for a lot of people, Blake is this extraordinary castle, this really amazing mm -hmm. Gothic castle that they're not allowed in. But inside it would be amazing, but they, they can't work out how to get in there. And, yeah. you know, in fact, that, the whole point of the book is, uh, is hopefully a way in to sort of, and once yes. they're in there, then they're, they're off, you know. Well, well and in many conversations with friends who are academics working in other areas of romanticism, there's very often this feeling that, you know, of course, if, if you study Wordsworth, then of course you know Coleridge. Yeah. If you study Byron and Shelley, you know, they, they, they will go together. And actually, yeah. any of these writers, they have a shared cultural background, you know. So, so if, they're, if they're wrong on mythology, it will tend to be the classics, as indeed with lots of 18th century. You know, it's Roman gods and, and sometimes pagan deities for a bit of exoticism. Yeah. Blake invented his own. So, you know, this <laughs> when I get to Golga News, right? I saw, you know, so friends are saying, yeah, I, I, that bowl of hula stuff, I just can't work any of this out. And so, so actually, even in the academic sphere, it's this kind of very opaque system that mm. people get confused by. And, and actually, as you say, in a sense, your, your book's intended as a kind of manual, you know, a, a reader's guide to, to uh, yeah, not simply the works of Blake, but the world seen through Blake's eyes. That's, that's certainly the, the hope. I mean, it's very much not an academic book. I mean, it's shocking pink and yellow for a start. It, it doesn't have a subtitle. My so. wife loves the cover, by the way. So oh, yeah. I sure oh, has bright you. pink hair. So, you know, actually, sometime I'll take a photo of her next to the yes. book. You'll see why that, immediately. That would be perfect, yes. Um, what was I saying? Um, so, yeah, it's, it's um, you know, I'm outside of academia. Um, and it's a hindrance in some ways, but it's a real liberation in, in many other ways. You know, I can just do what I like, basically, and not sort of 
fear that my reputation is is under is going to suffer or any, anything like that. So uh, I, it's it's academic academia is interesting. It's this real sort of Blakeian contrast because um, he was treated really well by academia, especially in the twentieth century. I mean, I can just go on Amazon and get like a copy of Blake records. Yes. And it will come through the post for 40 quid and have all that information. Yes. Uh, and it's a godsend, you know, if you, yeah. before people had things like that. You know, it's just brilliant. Academics treated him so well. But you know, at the same time, he'd really be miffed about that. You know, he was really against, you know, the hirelings of the universities and yes. the, the, the rote learning and the, you know, the sense that the mind, if it was a room, it wasn't a storeroom. It was an artist studio. It was for sort of creating. And that... Um, the fact that people are understanding now in academia via Eurozone, essentially, it's, it's a very sort of Eurozone based understanding, you know, it'd be sort of, you know, it would rankle with him. And, but um, because of his, you know, his love of countries, he would have been fine with it. It's that it's like, the, you know, the devourers and the prolif prolific. Yes. You'd expect he'd be against the devourers, but, you know, that's the way it is. And but that's that's how to accept it. One thing I really enjoyed reading your book was actually an incredibly fresh, vivid prose, which is actually throughout all your work. And actually, I mean, forgive me, this is going to be about your book, but I mean, for, for 20 years now, I've been writing about Blake's impact on pop culture in various forms. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm a massive fan of the fact that, you know, I, I can pick up um, bizarre, you know, well, well, well bizarrely sort of dance records and stuff and there's going to be you know sort of a, a line from you know songs of experience or something thrown there occasionally we're bludgeoned to death with it by you too or something like that but actually <laughs> it's probably I mean my argument's been for a very long time that Blake appeals to contemporary artists and audiences in a way that supersedes just about every other figure from the past, with mm. the exception, I think, because he's so ingrained in English consciousness of Shakespeare. Yes. But actually, after Shakespeare, um, th th there are other ones. I mean, I'm being very unfair here to you know people like Jane Austen, etc., who actually created basically our view of romance and, and a whole sure. host of social interactions. But sure. but but as a writer, you just pick out, or an artist, you pick out. I constantly, constantly encounter people who are kind of like. Um, that's my Blake. Yeah. And this is a really, I can't remember who it was, that one commentator said that Blake, unlike other artists, people talk about him as though he's still alive. He's not this yeah. historical figure in the past. And, yeah. and actually what I really appreciate about your book was that what you're trying to do then is, you know, yes, he is alive. And is, you see him here, you see him there. Well, what's interesting about what you what you just said is that, like with Shakespeare, you know, you've got like the Royal Shakespeare, you've got the Globe, you've, you're taught it at school, you turn yes. on BBC One, you've got your Jane Austen or something like that. It's sort of given to you from on high that the establishment sort of hand it back down. We don't really do that with Blake. We sort of come to it um, much more organically. He sort of comes up through the cracks in the in the, the background. You see, you see it in sort of 1960s graffiti. Or, yes. or you know, video games like Devil May Cry Five, or or, or comics like The Sandman, or uh, you know, he, he just he just comes through low culture as well as on high in in a way in a, in a way that still reaches people. It's yes. it's great. It is great. And also, you know, that that from that you have to find him very often, and and certainly for the more you know, certainly the elements of his mythology, which you, I mean, we'll we'll come into an element of that in a moment. Actually, your your discussion, for example, of the four Zoas, where you know you you, get, I mean, I actually love those. There's one paragraph. I'm not. I'm going to leave through the book and try and find it. I should have bookmarked this. But you give the plot of Jerusalem or the plot of Four Zoas. You know, basically, <laughs> Albion was once whole, fell apart, and one day he's going to rise again. It's sort of like. Yeah, that's that's pretty no, but that is, as you say, in terms of plot, but but of course you've got this hundred page Jerusalem, the emanation exactly, of the giant yeah. Albion, which as you yeah. say, you know, this incredibly dense poetry. But you know, yeah. that, that complex mythology, nobody is taught that at school. You yes. know, in a way that you'll get the kings of England and the history plays of, of Shakespeare, etc. Absolutely. And because we're coming up to this 2027, this 200th anniversary of his death. Yes. And there's that line in Jerusalem, every 200 years, a door to eternity appears, yes. which jumps out at me every single time. Yes. You know, Absolutely. He was singing of, uh, you know, seeing eternity as he died 200 years later. And I just sort of want people to be 
prepared for it and have a sense of him and have a and not be afraid of reading him and him to be much more of a cultural touchstone um i want him shared more basically yeah that's, yes for, for people who's important to it's great and you know yeah. that's, that's that's fine but it would just be a better world if there were more yeah. out there that's just Um, did, did you spend a lot of time around the Tate exhibition, by the way? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I was... I time to that. I no. I, I, I was very foolish at first. I didn't have a season ticket, as it were. And then I realised, <laughs> how much money am I spending going to the Tate every month? But the yeah. thing that, that was absolutely fantastic about that was it was clearly... It wasn't just all the usual faces. Absolutely. It was clearly a new audience. And I, I was... Half the time I was standing, observing the room, you know, watching people as they stand in front of, you know, yeah. uh, Elohim creating Adam or something and just watching their faces in <laughs> strange bliss as they yeah. kind of, as it overcame them, overwhelmed them. I mean, I um, I mentioned in the book, it, it, they sold 238,000 tickets, nearly a quarter yeah. million tickets yes. for that. What I don't say is because everybody went back about 10, 10 times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. But I, I think I think I'm really benefiting from that audience going to see those 300 works, that overwhelming sort of works, recognizing that it chimes with them and connects with them, but then sort of not knowing where to means. go at that yeah. at that point. Really, that's that's what I'm yes. sort of. Yes. That seems to be working for, for the book so far, Touchwood. Yes, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll pick a couple of things. I mean, um, actually, we, we've touched upon it already, so. The kind of the, the, the complexities of Blake Smith, and this is the thing that's always fascinated me, is that there have historically been a considerable number of writers and poets and artists who work in mythological traditions. You know, that's not new to Blake at all, quite the opposite. That's a, you know, yeah. in a sense, most art originates in that kind of sacred sphere. Yeah. What was new to Blake? Uh, and it, it's something that T.S. Eliot was very critical of when writing yeah. about Blake and the Sacred Wood, is that he basically rolled his own mythology. He, he cultivated his own crop um, yeah. and, and very much smoked it. Um, <laughs> and, and, and for, I mean, Eliot's point was that, because actually he's quite a perceptive critic and, and he, he loves Blake's lyric poetry. You know, he genuinely believes that Blake is a great poet. But yeah. what, he, what he has a problem with is, is the mythology, is this invention uh -huh. without any tradition, without any support structure behind it yes but he's 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 writing from the modernist world you know we're the other side of the postmodern world now this makes yes. it makes far more sense to us absolutely uh, and, and that that sense that blake makes more sense as we progress as a as a you know a culture as we get further and further away as we learn more ourselves as we change and grow we start to go oh yeah now i see what he means and yes. then 10 years like oh that's what he was on about it's yeah. it's like we're slowly trying to catch up with him and it's like taken us 200 years and we've still got a long way to go, don't get yes. me wrong, but we are moving in the right direction, I think. I mean, a friend and I, we were working on a, a journal a couple of years ago and the, the subtitle was, you know, William Blake, the man from the future. Almost yeah. like this time traveller sent back yeah. with, with visions yeah, what, of what the world was going to be like. What's, what's pleased me is at um, is it 17 South Moulton Street, mm -hmm. um, there is the Doctor Who Time Fracture interactive theatre experience. And when it was Blake at 19, or was it the other way around? Maybe he was at 17 and it's at 19. And they've, they've changed they've, they've, they've changed the address because you're coming in around the side now, but it's the same building, yes. right? So it's like next door but one for where he was writing, you know, Jerusalem and uh, and finishing Milton and all those sort of things. There is, according to Doctor, a huge crack through time. And it's, yeah. <laughs> it just explains a lot in my mind. Yes. <laughs> I mean, actually, there's an interesting point you're saying about um, you're writing this book that you, you know, it's not an academic text in that sense. And, and it's very much to appeal. If, if we stick with that crowd, the sort of people who went to the Blake exhibition at the Tate yeah. um, and, you know, sort of overwhelmed by this. Inc I mean, one of the things that was absolute balm to my soul was seeing these people who realised possibly for the first time in their life when they saw so much work together, yeah. that this is a great artist, not simply... Yeah. Not simply an interesting artist, but generally yeah. a great artist. And sometimes, sometimes they're the great artist who paints bad paintings. But when he produced the most brilliant work, it was a vision that changed the way we saw. Uh, that sense of just the constant work 
Yeah. You know, yes. so it, it fit all that in one lifetime, and that's what we have preserved. What we've one of, one of my great my favorite quotes is by Marky e. Smith. He says one of the reasons he likes Blake is because he was a grifter. You know, yeah. that, a graf, grafter. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Get the word right. Um, a grafter. He just yeah. he constantly worked all his life, and he said, you know, that's one of the problems that that Marky e. Smith saw that you know people who kind of claim Blake for the hippie culture of the sixties yeah. fail to get the work ethic. You know, <laughs> fail to get yeah. the fact that he had to labor to produce this stuff as well it's another connection with bill drummond from the klf mm -hmm. he, yes. he always see he sees art as work yes he's got this presbyterian background and and jimmy to an extent they they, they is a job and they're going to do the job no matter yes. how ludicrous it is <laughs> yeah. yes you're going to see it through and finish it off and tick it off and then the next job and then the next job and then yes. the next job but um so it's interesting you know you, you're writing for this audience that probably as you say they, they, they want the keys to the castle. They want to to, to an, an entry they, route. They, they want permission to enter. I, yes. I think I, I think that's it. They don't want to be like judged yes. by like like a stern old man for, for not knowing the secrets. Absolutely. They they, they, they um yeah they, they, it's it's the reason that have been what's been keeping people away from Blake has been on my mind quite a lot recently. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously it's a many factored, complicated, complicated thing. Um, and it's difficult. There is at the core of his philosophy, uh, a difference to the West, the rest of Western sort of philosophy, um, which is why I think he had to make his own myth, his own myth up. You know, this this belief that they're all, all deities reside in the human breast. Is the opposite of you know um, Plato's idealized forms, or you know the, the Christian belief that heaven is out there. You know the idea that, that the spiritual world, the immaterial world, is is inside. It's a simple switch, you know, and it's and it's not you know blasphemous. You know, if you look at the Gospel mm -hmm. of Luke, you know, the kingdom of heaven is within. But that's certainly not how we're taught. We're taught mm -hmm. that like heaven is a place that is a distance away, and you won't get to see it this year, this lifetime. But if you're good, you might go there. But you know, it, it, the idea that it's no, it's something that will awaken within you, and then that will turn London into Jerusalem when it yes. you know, rises in you. Um, is such a fundamentally different one and i do i do think it's one that works well now in this this you know fairly secular 21st century the example, example I've, I've taken to using quite a lot when i'm doing talks and stuff because it seemed to work for people is that you know you might not believe that hell is like a real physical place in a location that you can be sent to but you've probably met someone who's living in hell Mm -hmm. Yes. And what you see in that sense, the idea that Blake was living in, in paradise, as you know, he claimed, especially towards the end of his life, that starts to make sense. And the as a man is, so he sees, you know, that mm -hmm. the, the, how Jerusalem is built by you creating, you know, a paradise, a heaven inside yourself. Um, it's, you know, it, you can talk to atheists about things like that. Yes. Yes, and it and you can see something going on in their eyes. Yeah. It's, it yes. sort of makes sense. It sort of makes sense. So, but that, that, that sense of creating paradise within you. There's a it's it's upstairs. Um, and there's a book I've got, nineteenth century book uh, called the Scottish Chiefs, and it's this not highly entertaining history of the the, the chieftains of Scotland. But it, it has a little biographical note by the author in which said that as a young girl she was introduced to Blake. Yeah. And, and she said, you know, uh, she was about six years old, something like that. And, and he said, yeah. I, and I hope, my dear, that one day you're as happy as, as I am. And she said, she looked up at this old man who's he's nearly he's in his 60s, you oh. know, dirty hats, crease clothes, and things. She was sort of like, what on earth are you talking about? And when she was writing <laughs> a book in her 80s, she said, mm. I finally understood what yeah. he was telling me. She wow. just had this memory. She'd taken with her all, the, all her life, this memory yeah. of this, this impoverished artist, this stranger at the party <laughs> and hit the happiest man in the room the, the man who was living in paradise i mean i think it's yeah. bentley describes him the stranger from paradise yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, but the, a point is going to make you, you whilst this is a book you know for general audience you do not shy at all from big ideas i mean you know sort of the nature of time and space which is yeah, always well, a pleasure to blakeian scholars <laughs> Hopefully, I mean the the joy about books books about Blake is that uh, you know I, I talk in there about how Blake is such a multifaceted and sort of complex sort of thing that everyone who approaches him finds their interests sort of reflected back, 
Uh, and if you look at books like, um, say, you know, Witness Against the Beast or um, The God of the Left Hemisphere or Why Mrs. Blake Cried. Yes. In fact, those three books are all about the same person. It's astonishing because yes. they're so different and they're coming from such different angles and they're finding such different things. Um, but they're all uh, useful. You know, they're all they're all inspiring. They may, you know, you can find faults about, say, he's a Muggletonian or, yes. or the, the left hemisphere model or, you know, but even so, you know, every time you get an extra angle on Blake, an extra perspective, it's, you know, it's, it's, of, it's of use, hopefully, hopefully to, so hopefully even, you know, diehard Blakeians who know their engines to, to steal a joke from, <laughs> from John Reed. Um, uh, God, I can't believe I did the steal. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, I'll pull the joke, John. Um, hopefully they'll find something in there that fits with their take and, and, and is useful to them as well. Yeah difficult but it's the figure of the giant album is not what people expect him to be no, you know it's the fallen man it's not it's not the jingo celebration yeah. and you yeah. actually pick up this and i wonder if this also sorry if this fits in with other elements of your writing you know kind of you know watling street and just other elements that you've explored i i i definitely think it does with with albion it's um i had always had the impression that the the story of Blake's myth was essentially that Urizen is bad, but you know, uh, Loss or Athona is is will sort of defeat them, and, and that, that's what I thought it was all about. Yeah. Uh, and that was very much how it was portrayed in the nineteen sixties. Yeah. Uh, that creativity will will defeat the yeah. rational sort of thing. So when I finally came to read the Four Zoas, which I you know I put off for a long, long time. And it, and it gets to that ending where the, the four Zoas just sort of come into balance and then they have this feast and then that sweet science reigns. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, this is the, also the waking of Albion, isn't it? This is, yes. the, uh, this is the arrival of the poetic genius or the light of Christ or the yeah. visionary state or however you want, want to put it. Um, that was a real sort of surprise to me. That was a real sort of uh, a shock that it was essentially... Um, it was um, uh, that it had that positive ending to it, which I hadn't sort of expected. And there's there's a um, a key thing for my book was a quote he said to um, uh, Henry Crabb Robinson uh, when they first met, and he, he'd asked about the divinity of Christ, and and Blake had said, "He's the only God, and so am I, and so are you." And uh, I put it at the start of my book where it makes no sense, but. By the end, hopefully it will make a lot more sense because it, it very distinctly wasn't, you know, he is the only God and I'm pretty much there as well, thanks to my artistic practice. You're nowhere near Henry, sorry. It, it wasn't that. No. It, Blake never sort of wants to portray himself as like a giant, as more than human, as something beyond a normal human individual it's just he wants you to realize that a, a normal human individual is much more than you may have thought yes just, you know that's that's that sort of um so central to it so things like uh how he connected his vision state the poetic genius to the sense of christ consciousness for, for want of a better word um i suddenly realized why it didn't matter that jesus wasn't you know an artist or a musician or, or a painter or, or something like that as, as the way he combined you know christianity and imagination and uh and, and things like that so for the book a large part of it was to treat blake as a human who mm. you shouldn't be scared of i didn't yes. want my readers to be sort of scared of him because i didn't want him on the pedestal i mean it sounds daft to say you're trying to humanize a human you know, there's clearly something gone wrong when you when you're talking in those sort of terms already. Uh, but to show him as, as the human that he was, uh, that you would you know that you'd want to meet, that you wouldn't be scared of, you know. But, but that's unfortunately. I'm oh, sorry. I can say, unfortunately, that's a lot of the myths around the artist, which of course have their origins in the Romantic period. You know that, yeah. that this is a figure yes. that is somehow detached. I mean, you know, people like Wagner very much make this part of their practice. You know, you cannot yeah. touch me. I am above you. It's and just Blake. not there in Blake, though. You just read him, it's just not there. It, it, yeah. It's gone. Whereas at the same time, a lot of the book is aiming to make people sort of question their own understanding of imagination and consciousness yes. and to get a sense of how 
what a varied spectrum that that is. And, and uh, there's a great discussion sort of, of imagination. Yeah, by yeah. The way. marvel more at it, imagination than sort of Blake the Man. That's uh, yeah. that's essentially what I was sort of trying. To I, I say you. I say you, you have a wonderful discussion of imagination and kind of those multiple tier, I mean, at different points, both questions of perception, how Blake operate, you know, again, this is really common to, to anybody who reads lots of Blake or, or, you know, that he just, as a matter of course, operated on multi-level perceptions on a regular basis. So he wasn't mad. He just, in fact, I've often, you know, very often thought that Blake was one of the sanest of people because he just could... He realised that that all these conflicting sensory perceptions that you'd receive are actually part of living, Absolutely. and you don't run from them. You Absolutely. use them and you enjoy them. He could completely immerse them, but also then imagination as the tool to make this into a sense of self that that forgets itself. I mean, you you, you have a wonderful passage talking about a chapter talking about this loss of selfhood and how you know this is so important to what it's, I think I think that was what I was trying to remember earlier when I went I went black uh, because the, that sense of uh, well nationalism and, and things like that yeah. but to see um through Blake's eyes to to have that sort of that vision state uh does require the sort of loss of sense of self this this yes. this self-annihilation of Blake yes Blake yes to, um that it would be you know, familiar to people for, for many different ways of, of sort of achieving that, you know, be that meditation or, or whatever that when you if when you're familiar with uh, the story of yourself dissolving away, and you're just not and you become aware, but not aware of something, you just become aware. Um, if you're familiar with that state, then you read Blake, the sense of being outside of urism, you get it immediately. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense what he's talking about. When yeah. you're sort of trapped inside your reason, inside your sort of rational uh, sort of thing, and you and you deny that there's something outside of that, that's when Blake's difficult. That's yes. when Blake's difficult. Yes. But for people, because what's really, um, oh, I've, I've just slightly blown my own trumpet here, but it's it's on it's on topic, so forgive me. Um, as I say, the book was aimed at people who. Um, who were who, who sort of newish to Blake or, or, or unfamiliar with Blake or, or wanted to know more about Blake. But the messages I've got back from people who are more familiar with a, a Blakean state of consciousness um, and who've read the book and it's been very important to them has really sort of really sort of touched me. There's one was a, a, a writer um, who I admire greatly and I've never, I've never met, but he'd been sent the book uh, and he, he wrote back this personal message to me about how he's had that sense of being annihilated by his his own imagination of being overtaken by it and many times like thought it was he'd gone mad and he'd sort of lost his madness and so the fact that the book gave a framework or by looking at Blake there suddenly was a sense that no this isn't this isn't madness this, this is this um was was very important to him very helpful to him and there was a guy who'd gone on touch on Twitter who'd been in a coma and he'd said he'd been in a blaking state of consciousness in, in in this coma, which he's still trying to process and sort of deal with. And then again, the book seemed to, seemed to help him there. So for even though I'm sort of saying, oh, it's an introduction to Blake, the fact that it makes sense and is helpful to people with those more extreme states of consciousness, yes. um, it delights me. It really does. Yes. I, you know, I'm thrilled by that. I really am. Well, I'm just going to take a moment to pause here and just say, um, I can understand entirely why you would both be thrilled and why people would respond in this way. So, so William Blake versus the world by John Higgs, who I've had immense pleasure talking to today.